But the Lord's just laid on my heart as we've been working through our series on Sunday nights about how to study the Bible. And I feel like that's dealing with half of the equation when it comes to our relationship with God. And as I've been speaking with some of you, I've got some really good questions about, okay, this is what we're talking about, how to read the Bible, but what about prayer? What should it look like when we're really seeking the Lord's face in prayer? And how important is prayer? It's vitally important. Communication is everything, isn't it? If we're to have a relationship with anyone in our life, it's been a long time. Well, let's have a refresher. Since we've been quarantined all this time, for a relationship with other people, there has to be communication, right? That means speaking and listening. And sometimes we struggle with one of those more than the other. When it comes to our relationship, but that's not enough by itself. God wants to hear from us. So I think the big question that we as Christians should all have is what does God want my prayer life to look like? What does God want my communication of? What should praying actually look like as God intends it? Now, we can run into a lot of problems. Say, well, I think I should read my Bible like this. I think this is how I should approach the scriptures. And it's just as dangerous when we're relying on our own understanding when it comes to prayer. Prayer is not just, here's what I think it should be. And you can think whatever you think it should be. And whatever you come up with is fine. That's not how life works. God has a plan for how we should approach the scriptures. And God has a plan for how we should approach prayer. And so we can have this question. So we had this question when I was candidating. What, what is my plan for the church? Well, ultimately, it doesn't really matter what my plan is. It's not my plan, it's God's plan, because it's not my church, it's God's church. But I think the essence of that question is good. What are the building blocks of a strong church? Because that should be our heartbeat for this church to grow, not just numerically, but qualitatively. How do we grow spiritually? What are the building blocks of a strong church. And I think to answer that question, we have to dig a little deeper and ask this question, what are the building blocks of a strong family, right? Because we will not have a strong church if it's not composed of strong families. And then if we drill down even a little bit deeper, we can ask this question, what are the building blocks of a strong Christian? Because until it gets to this level, we'll, we're just speaking comes home to me. What are the building blocks in my life if I'm to be a strong Christian? It all comes down to consistent, effective Bible reading and consistent, effective praying. If we neglect either of these areas, there's a chain reaction of consequence here. I will not be a strong Christian if I'm not consistent and effective in my praying. And I'm not a strong Christian if I'm not consistent and effective in my Bible reading. And what's the consequence? You say, well, it doesn't really seem... ...independently of personal responsibility. If we want a strong church, it starts with me. And if we want a strong church, it starts with you. And it starts with us here in reading the Bible God's way and in praying God's way. We have a large degree of personal responsibility here. So prayer. How important is prayer? We've just said that it's essential. Well, let's listen to some of these quotes. Martin Luther said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. You say, okay, well, that sounds good, right? But do we live this way? Do we live as if prayer is as vital to us as our next breath? If not, then we don't see the importance of prayer. Oswald Chambers said, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. 
Prayer is not just the means to an end. Prayer is essential and vital itself. It is the great work. And so often in our personal lives, we can say, you know what? I just don't feel like I have time today. With all the responses that's as long as my arm, I'm just not sure that I have time to spend in prayer. We've got it completely backwards. The busier we are, the more time we should be spending in prayer. George Mueller understood this. Are we familiar with George Mueller? Who started these orphanages just on faith, and they would be sitting down to eat a meal, and the children would be at the table saying, what are we having to eat? And George Mueller would pray. That's faith. And George Mueller would rise early and commit to so much time in prayer, hours of prayer. Why? Because he saw the essential nature of prayer. Charles Spurgeon said, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. Sometimes it can feel like that too, can't it? I just feel like I'm going through a mental exercise of just, okay, checking it off my to-do list, saying the things that I think I need to say, going through it in my head, it just feels like a mental exercise. Or sometimes it can feel like a vocal performance. I need to say just the right words. And say them in the right order because other people need to see how spiritual I am. God's not impressed. I think that's one of the delightful things about working with children. When you hear the way that they pray, right? If you've prayed with kids, you've heard the way that they talk to God. That's the way that you and I should be praying. It makes me laugh in our family devotions to hear the different things that Ella prays. Ella will pray and say, God, thank you for bears. And thank you that they have claws to dig in the dirt. (laughs) We feel like we have to say certain words and impress other people with our vocabulary. It may impress other people, but it doesn't impress God. God wants us to pray like a child, to come to him in that childlike faith. That's what pleases him. That's what impress him put on airs, and that's what he cares about. It's not a mere mental exercise or a vocal performance. It's far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. You and I speak with God, the creator, in a real, intense, and personal way. It's not something that's just in our heads. And it's not something that's just show or performance. E.M. Bound said, prayer makes a godly man. Do we want to be godly? Do we want to be strong spiritually? It doesn't happen independently of prayer. Prayer makes a godly man and puts within him the mind of Christ the mind of humility, of self-surrender, of service, of pity, and of prayer. Prayer helps us have the right mind about prayer. If we really pray, we will become more like God, or else we will quit praying. So where are we? Are we giving up on prayer? Are we committed to it because it makes us more like God? Well, these are what men have had to say about prayer. Let's see what the Bible has to say about prayer. James 5, 16b, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It accomplishes great things. And he goes on in this passage to write, Elias, this is Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. Now, this is an important phrase because what's our tendency to do? When we see how God used Elijah, say, well, God used him because he was some super Christian. What could I possibly have in common with Elijah? Look how God used him. So, of course, his prayer life was different than mine because he was Elijah. Now, James starts with disabusing us of this excuse No, Elijah was a man just like we are. He was a sinner just like we are. He struggled with temptation just like we do. Subject to like passions as we are. But get this, in spite of his own sinfulness because of his human nature, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Would you say that's powerful praying? Yes. That's a miraculous answer. Why? Because Elijah was special? No, because God honors and answers prayer of normal people like you and me and Elijah. And look how this passage continues in verse 18. 
And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain. After three and a half years, do you think he was nervous that it would work again? <laughs> the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. How powerful is prayer? Matthew 17, 20. Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. How Jesus is teaching his disciples and Jesus is teaching us, it has. Why do we give up on Because we don't believe this. If you and I were really convinced of this truth, that, great, that faith as small as a grain of mustard seed could yield these great results, don't you think you and I would pray differently? Don't you think you and I would be committing more time to it? If we really believed what Jesus said about prayer, and look what he said, impossible unto you. No, we live defeated lives because we don't believe God's promise about prayer. This is truth. And Jesus is not just saying to his disciples they had this privileged access to prayer. This powerful prayer, this powerful resource. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. This is a command. This is not optional. This is not a recommendation. And this is not temporary. Pray without ceasing. Pray Pray unceasingly. Don't stop. But what do we do? Well, you know what? I haven't seen an answer. So I'm not sure that it works. And so we give up on prayer. Commit to it because we don't believe in it. And so we cease. And we have this command in Scripture, pray without ceasing. John 14, 14, Jesus says, If ye shall ask anything in my name, will do it. We have promise after promise after promise. Somehow we don't believe them. Or somehow we say they don't really apply to us. James 4, 2. This is a ringing endorsement, isn't it? To our question, well, why don't I see this kind of powerful praying in my life? James says, ye have because ye ask not. We've ceased. We've given up. So why don't we pray like we should? We don't value prayer like we should. Or perhaps we don't know how. For a long time when I was working with the teens at Westgate, I just kept saying the same thing over and over and over. Read your Bible and pray because that's the most important thing. And we'd have point sheets that the kids would turn in. And sometimes there would just be these big gaps where the kids weren't reading their Bible or praying at all. I thought, why aren't we committed to this? And then it finally dawned on me. Maybe I, I'm asking them to do something that they don't know how to do. Can't that be true of us? We can be saved for a long time, but sometimes still struggling about what is God's taught how to. Maybe we've never really understood what biblical praying looks like. So my prayer for us this morning is that God Maybe we've given up on prayer. Maybe we don't believe in it or see its value like we should. May God help us with that. Maybe we've never understood how to pray. And I, I pray that this morning God would help us with that as well. And this is not yet our passage for this morning, but it's, this is the actual introduction. This is, this is paving the way for what we're going to get to. Luke 11, 1, it says, And it came to pass that as he, who's this he? Jesus, as Jesus praying. Now, can we stop and think about that? Of all the people that could get away without praying. Well, Jesus, you're God. Jesus, you're perfect. Jesus, you've never sinned. Jesus, you can work miracles. What need do you have to pray? Don't you think that that would be a valid question, an argument that we could make? Yet we find Jesus' life consumed with praying. If Jesus saw the affair, shouldn't we? And it was not unusual for his disciples to find him in prayer. Or sometimes because of prayer. 
Jesus, where were you? Everyone's seeking you. And Jesus would depart early in the morning to a desert place to pray. And his disciples see this over and over and over, this pattern of praying. And so it's natural that one of the disciples says this, when Jesus had ceased praying, one of his disciples said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. We see you praying, we see God working, and we realize we can't pray like you can pray. This should be our heart's desire this morning. Lord, I don't know how to pray like I should. Maybe you've been saved for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But God wants from us the same kind of humility to say, God, I want to pray like Jesus Christ prayed. God, I want to pray the way you want me to pray. Will you teach me? This teachableness requires humility of us. But can't we acknowledge that we don't pray like we should? Can't we start there? Can't we acknowledge that God promises to answer mightily? Can't we see the need to learn to pray God's way? Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, John the Baptist had followers. And John the Baptist taught those followers how they should pray. And so this disciple is saying, Jesus, won't you teach us? We want to pray like you pray. And Jesus answered this request with what we know of today as the Lord's Prayer. This is where this fits because we come to the Lord's Prayer somehow disconnected from its context, right? We see the Lord's Prayer printed off maybe on on a picture on a wall or maybe you have it on a bookmark or maybe it's something that you've memorized. And we see it kind of disconnected from where it fit in Scripture. When Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer, he gave it a direct response to this question. Will you teach us how to pray? And that's when Jesus answers. So turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 6, 9 through 13. And before you get scared, looking at the clock and looking at this passage, I know we're not going to get through all of it this morning. I get very ambitious, but I went through it last night just to see if we could get and we're not going to make it in one. We'll probably do this t- this morning and tonight. So wherever we get to when the clock runs out, uh, we'll pick up from there tonight. But this is our passage for this morning, Matthew 6 through 13. This is a familiar passage. But could I ask you this morning, even though it's familiar, even if it's memorized, for you to approach it with fresh eyes? Sometimes when we're so close to something, we lose what it's actually saying, don't we? It's so familiar to us that some, sometimes it can kind of lose its power or lose its significance. Don't let that happen to us this morning. Read to praying correctly. This is the answer to that request. Teach us to pray. He says this, after this manner, therefore, this is how you should pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, when we read this, we say, well, that's not hard at all, right? Pray this prayer in a minute, maybe less if I read fast. So that's all I have to do. Praying is easy. This prayer is not a mantra to chant. This is not a memorized prayer that God mindlessly. That's not how this works. Because if you think about it, if this is all that prayer consisted of, how did Jesus pray hour in the garden? How did Jesus pray rising a great while before day? He could have been way more efficient if he just recited this, right? Well, that's not how this prayer works. But so often we hear it said, and that's not what this prayer is. Look at these first words. We're going to take this just one phrase at a time. After this manner. 
these words are as important as any of the other words because this is teaching us how to approach the Lord's Prayer. He says, after this manner. In other words, what he's saying is, follow this example. Not recite these words. This is not just a prayer to say over and over. This is a model to follow. It's an outline to build on. It's the framework that we should be fleshing out. This is a model to follow. And you may say, well, what's the difference, right? What's the big difference between just the model to follow and the actual prayer itself? Are we just splitting hairs? What's wrong with just praying this Lord's Prayer as a model prayer instead of just following the model prayer? What's the big difference? Well, if, if we would look at it from another perspective, let's use this illustration. If you were to acquire the top secret recipe for the best chocolate cake in the world, right? The best one ever. And you got that top secret recipe. You received it. It's in your possession. But then instead of following the recipe, you ate the recipe. How absurd would that be? You say, well, that's foolish. Who would do that? Obviously, if I want that delicious cake, the recipe is the way to get there, right? That's the pattern that I follow. That's absurd. No one would do that. No one in here would eat a recipe. We understand how recipes work. Who would do that? Well, we do that very same thing when we recite the Lord's Prayer itself instead of following the model. It's equally absurd. Jesus is saying, I'm giving you now is not the prayer itself. It's not to go with our illustration, the chocolate cake. It's telling you how to get there. It's the recipe. It's the model. It's the pattern. The Lord's Prayer is the pattern for the way that you and I should pray. It's not the prayer itself. It's the recipe that we're to follow. The Lord's Prayer is how we should pray. It's not what we should pray. Does that make sense? It might sound like splitting hairs, but it's the, all the difference in the world when it comes to how our actual devotions should work. This is the model that we're to follow. After this manner, this is how I want you to pray. And look how it begins. When you're praying, pray in this way. Our Father. Pray personally. This is incredible. And again, this is something that I think we so often take for granted, but take a step back and think about this. God, the creator of the universe, the one who made everything, could relate to us rightfully as the master, and we are just the subject. We are just the servant. We are just the slave who have to keep a respectful distance from him. And he would be just if he were to choose that means of relating to us, wouldn't he? What right do we have to have closer access to God? What right do we have to have any access to God? In fact, there are many religions that view their false God this way. He's a God that's far off and to be terrified of that will do you harm, so don't be on the bad side of him. Friends, that's not how God has chosen to relate to us. God has chosen in his love and in his mercy to claim us as his children. God says, you can know me in a real and personal way. You can call me your dad. That's incredible. One of the greatest joys I have with having Olivia and Ella and them running to see me. I love that. I know someday they might outgrow that. Probably will outgrow that. Probably should outgrow that. When they're 30, that'd be awkward. But I love when I come home and they come running to me, running to see me, just wanting to be close. I love that. It speaks of relationship and it goes both ways. As their father, it warms my heart. And as their child, I'm, with them as my children, I'm glad they feel that they can run to me. I love that relationship. And God says that's the relationship that we know him through. It's the same closeness. God is your father. So think about that in an earthly way. What does that mean? What does that entail? There's not a time that Olivia or Ella say, you know what, I wish I could talk to dad, but he just feels so distant. I don't know if he wants to hear me. I don't know if he wants to listen. That thought never crosses their mind. 
In fact, there are times that I have to say, I can't listen right now. <laughs> I'm trying to do things that I can't multitask. Thought never crosses their mind that I'm not accessible. God says, this is the same relationship. Yet God never reaches a point where he says, I can't listen right now. Because God's God, he's perfect. He can listen to all of us. He wants to. God is our father. If you are a believer, if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you know God and can know and should know God in this personal way. God is your father. That means God knows you. That means God loves you. That means God cares for you. I'm not exasperated when Olivia or Ella come to me with a question or a need. That's who God is. He loves you. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to seek him. He delights in you running to him just like I delight when my daughters run to me. Think of God this way. Don't develop this wrong theology that somehow God is far away from you, that somehow God is not concerned for you. God loves you dearly. You say, well, how do I know? He calls you his child and he calls himself your father. Pray this way. Psalm 103, 13, pitieth his children. Now, this word pity sounds different to us than, than it originally meant. It's as a father passion on his children. What kind of compassion does a parent have for a child? I never understood until I had kids. I'm one. I'm probably a helicopter parent. Because I can't stand it when they get hurt. When, when, they, when they get hurt and are screaming, it just tears us apart, doesn't it? We have compassion on our kids. Olivia's been riding her bike for a while, and she's fantastic riding her bike, and she's super fast. Well, she was riding a boy wanted to race her. Went tearing off down the cul-de-sac, and it's level. So I was about to find out flying side by side. And as they're racing, just as fast as, as both their legs can pump, he starts to veer towards Olivia. And this, this happened maybe a year ago. And as he veered towards Olivia, she tried to veer away. And in doing so, just lost control of her bike. And I just saw handlebars go, and I saw her go over the handlebars. And I'm standing too far away to do anything. But it was like time stood still. I could just see her going over, and there was nothing I could do. And I saw her hit the ground, and I don't even remember getting to her because I just sprinted because it was like, no, nothing. And so now every time she rides your bike, what am I saying? Olivia, slow down. <laughs> Olivia, don't get hurt. Why am I a helicopter parent? Because I love her and I don't want to see her hurt. I can't fix it. Her hurt. That's how God relates to us. God loves us in that same kind of way. That's why he says, just like a father has this care and concern and compassion for his children, a relationship with God. He feels that way towards us. He calls us his own. And not just in name only. He doesn't just say, yes, you can call me father, but don't take that too far. God says, I'm your father in this kind of way. Just like you love your children. That's how I relate to you. So the Lord has come on them that fear him. God relates to us as his children. And so we should relate to him as our father. Don't just say, well, I'm glad God feels that way about me. Feel that way towards him. When you pray, talk to God that way. Don't come to him afraid that he won't receive you. Don't come to him to love you. God's proven it and God's promised it, so believe it. Come to him without hesitancy. Come to God without reluctancy. Come to God confidently. As your heavenly father, in any good relationship, children love to spend time with their dads. They're not afraid of him. They know he loves them. And in the same way, God says, treat me that way. Know that I love you and come to me in confidence that I'll receive you. And come relentlessly. Kids ask their parents for things all the time. And we love them. We don't mind it. Come to God in the same kind of way. Confidently, relentlessly. Basis of relationship.
You're not asking God for something he hasn't already promised. Claim that promise. Take him up on it. So pray this way. When you pray, every time you read God's word, every time you go to God in prayer, realize the basis of this relationship and approach God. This God, thank you for letting me call you my father. I need to see you as my loving heavenly father. Help me to take you at your word. Which art in heaven? Okay, so what's this next part of this phrase communicating? Okay, so we should pray this way. God is personal to us. We have this relationship. We should pray through the means of this relationship, on the basis of this relationship. We should also acknowledge who God is. Yes, he's our father, but he's in heaven. So we should pray reverently. Don't take it for granted. Don't come to God flippantly. Pray reverently. Remember that God is your father, but he's also holy. Do you remember in the book of Isaiah, how the prophet Isaiah begins in the book? He's a prophet set to the nation of Israel, and he's angry. He's frustrated at the people's wickedness. And in fact, is brought into the very throne room of God. What does Isaiah begin saying then? In the throne room of God, he doesn't say, finally, you're listening to me. Now can we talk about just how wicked? That when Isaiah saw God for who God is, he fell on his face because he realized that when he saw God's holiness, he stopped saying, but look at these people. And he started saying, God, woe is poetic. Isaiah wasn't just using flowery speech. He said, I'm a dead man. Be in the presence of this holy and righteous God. So yes, we should come to God boldly, our Father, but we should come to God reverently because God is holy. We should have this big view of did. God is holy. God is powerful. God is to be respected. Come to God reverently because he's worthy of that. We should be praying reverently. Hebrews 4.16, eventually in our study of Hebrews, Hebrews 4.16 says this. Come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we love to quote this. And we should live this. Yes, we should be coming boldly to God, but coming boldly does not mean coming flippantly. It, does, it doesn't mean coming While we seek him earnestly, we should be approaching God reverently. So our Father, approach God through this relationship, which are in him reverently recognizing how holy he deserves respect hallowed be thy name what is this teaching us how do we build on this how do we flesh out this aspect of this model of praying pray for god to be glorified this is our first actual request we've been talking about who god is and how we should approach him but this is the actual first we should be praying. First in order, and it's first in priority. We should be praying this way. God, I want you to be glorified. I want your name to be made great. So I have here a picture of a magnifying glass because that's what our lives are to be. You and I are called to magnify God, to make him big in the eyes of others. When I was at Northland, I had a missions class. I was sure that God was calling me to missions. And of course, now God's sovereignly directed, and this is the best job I could ever have. But at that point in time, I thought, God's leading me to missions, so I'm taking a missions class. And the teacher said, what is the goal of missions? And I thought, and I'm glad I didn't say my thought, to, say, to see people get saved, right? That's the goal of missions. I want people that have never heard the gospel to hear the gospel, to receive the gospel. That's my job as a missionary. And I didn't say that. 
31, your job as a missionary, your primary goal is to glorify God. And I, I just remember just walking away from that class just really confused. Because I thought, well, when I lead people to Christ, isn't God glorified by that? But then through continuing to listen, continuing to learn, continuing to study the scriptures, I realized if I make the ultimate goal just to see people get saved, then I could go about that the wrong way, couldn't I? If the overarching goal wasn't to glorify God, whatever it takes people to pray the prayer I'm going to do, theoretically I could do that, right? pragmatism the end justifies the means then whatever it takes to see people get saved i will do if that's the overarching purpose no what what drives missions is god must be glorified i've got to do missions god's way when i'm presenting the gospel god's way glorifying him then people are saved and i'm presenting the gospel the way god wants me to does that make sense and and one thing that i wrestled with too was this well if we're talking all about god's is it possible to diminish God's glory? I mean, God is who he is. I don't change that. So what is all this talk about glory? If, if I can't take away from God's glory, this is my thought process as a college student, if I can't take away from God's glory, then how could I possibly add to God's glory? I really wrestled with this question about well, how do we glorify God if God is who he is? And if God's glorified by people trusting him, and God somehow is glorified when people reject him by demonstrating his holiness, even in his wrath, then do, does it really matter how I live? Because he's going to be glorified either way. I wrestled with all of these questions until finally I realized when we're speaking of this glorifying God, we're saying in our relationship with others. Yes, God has all glory in heaven, but God doesn't always receive that recognition here on earth, does he? So when we're speaking of glory, we're saying in the eyes of others, Am I making God big? Or in the eyes of others, am I diminishing God's greatness? No, I can't. But the way I live my life has a direct impact on how others see him. So when I say I'm called to glorify God and I should be praying to glorify God, I'm saying, God, in my life, help me portray you in a way that others see you as big. Does that make sense? Is what Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify whom? You? No, glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is what glorifying God looks like. I live my life in such a way that people don't see me, that people see God. I'm not on display. You're not on, God's on display when we're living this kind of life. And if we're to live this kind of way, we pray this kind of way. God, I want your name to be made great, you to be glorified. So our prayer is this, God, please be glorified for who you are. And I pray that my life will magnify you. And I pray that others will magnify you. I pray that there's this chain reaction that the way I live my life draws others to a right relationship with you so that they'll live their life in a way that draws other people to you because it's all about you. Is that how we live? Is that how we think? No, from, from the very moment we wake up, our thoughts revolve around us, right? My alarm clock goes off and I say, I can't believe I have to get up already. I don't want to. I'll hit the snooze. I want to stay in bed. Why? Because my life is all about me. Naturally, that's how we're wired. What do I want to do today? What do I want to eat today? How do I want to spend my time? How do I want people to treat me? How do I want people to think about me? Who's on my Who am I trying to find? Think that way, it's all about myself. Our first request here in this model to praying, our first request that we should pray is not for our own needs to be met. That's often why we come. That's not how we should pray. It's not for our own needs to be met. Our first request is not for our wants to be satisfied. Our first request is for God to be glorified. That's why you and I exist. That's what the catechism states. What is man's chief end? 
Do we know this catechism? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why God made us. That's why we exist. It's to glorify God. And that's how we should be praying for God to be glorified, for his name to be lifted up, for his glory to be recognized, for him to be made big in the eyes of others. Clock, and I didn't even get his words out of it. So we'll pause here and we'll continue this tonight. But before we close, how do we apply this? I think if we're to respond to God the way that he wants us to, if we're to respond to God's word the way he wants us to, we have to start with acknowledging that you and I have been neglecting biblical praying. If we're going to be real, if we're going to get honest with God and with ourselves, it has to start with this acknowledgement. God, I haven't been living this praying kind of life. And I want to. Maybe I haven't even wanted to before. God, give me a desire to pray like your disciples. Teach me to pray. Help me to pray in a way that pleases you. Maybe you haven't been approaching God as your father. Maybe you're not even saved this morning and you would say, you know what? I've never had this relationship. You can today. You can trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and know God in this intimate, personal, family kind of way. If that's true, would you trust Jesus Christ today? Maybe you're saved, but you say, I feel distant from God. Okay, how do we fix that? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Restore your relationship with your father. If it's not good, make it good today. If you haven't started it, start it today. Our father, which art in heaven, do you have a big view of God? Do you reverence him? Don't treat him flippantly. Come to him respectfully, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Is your life all about God's glory? Or is yourself? Is my life all about God's glory or is my life all about myself? Until we fix these things, we're not praying correctly. We're saying words. We're impressing others or trying to. We're going through mental exercise. Let's not convince what actual prayer is. Let's not convince ourselves to be praying when we're not. Let's pray God's way. This is Jesus' answer. You want to learn how to pray? This is what it looks like. Would you commit to this kind of praying in your own personal life? Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And I thank you that you allow us to know you in this personal, intimate kind of way. I thank you that we can call you and know you as our Father. I pray that we would. I pray that we would seek you personally and relentlessly through this avenue of biblical praying. I ask that if there be one here this morning that doesn't know you as their Heavenly Father, that even today they would trust Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. For those of us that are truly saved. I pray that we would relate to you in this personal kind of way. And I pray that our lives would be committed to magnifying, to making your name great, to glorifying you as you've intended for our lives to do. I thank you so much that your desire for us is to pray the right kind of way. And I pray that we would have that same desire for ourselves. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I pray that we would respond to it now in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen.